1 Corinthians chapter number 11. We're going to look at verse number 17 through verse number 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 through 34. We're going to go to the Lord. We're going to read it, and we're going to come back to it. Uh, the Bible says this. Let's just stand, please, on the reading of the Word of God. I don't normally have you do this on a Wednesday night, but I want to do it tonight. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, now that's a very important thing to see. Notice it says you come together in the church. He's not talking about some spiritual uh, church, uh, body that you can't see. He's talking about like a local church, amen. You come together in the church. Christians come together in the church, amen. Uh, people that aren't Christians, don't, they don't come to church. <laughs> amen. And so it says that you come together in the church. I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. <laughs> For there must be also heresies among you. That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into what? One place. All right, so there you go. So a church is a place. Yeah. Amen. Don't ever let somebody make you feel bad because you talk about going to church. Yeah. And scripturally, biblically, this is called a church. Yeah. This building is called a church. Yeah. Scripturally and biblically. I just showed you that, amen. So don't get the wrong false doctrine and go the wrong way and get in a ditch somewhere. Well, we're the church. The building's not a church. Hey, you're going to mess up your Bible. You're going to mess up your doctrine. You're going to mess up your life. Amen. This is a church, the Bible says. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. That word drunken means full. Doesn't mean he's intoxicated. It means he's full. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise you the church of God? Notice he's talking about a place called the church of God too. I just think that's interesting. And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I receive the Lord, that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night, in which he was betrayed, took bread. That's one reason why we do it at night time. The same night which he, was took, which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. At the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened the Lord, that, when we, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. There's a lot of Bible words that got defined for you in that chapter. Amen. Damnation doesn't always mean hellfire. Right. Damnation just means judgment condemnation doesn't always mean being condemned to go to hell. Condemnation just means chastisement and judgment sometimes. See, we can be condemned, but not with the world. Right. When we walk in the flesh, mm. Romans says, if you walk in the Spirit, it talks about you won't be condemned. But how many of us sometimes don't walk in the Spirit? So we can be judged, but we cannot be judged and sent to hell. Amen. There's a difference there. All right, let's go Lord in prayer. Father, I pray you'll do a work, and I pray you'll do something special. Please, God, and ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. All right, now, I want to try to help you with this first uh, uh, about, before I give you a devotional side, I want to give you a doctrinal side about the Lord's Supper. And because I think it's very important to understand what we're doing here, okay? Some people don't understand. Some of you are new. Some of you are not new, but you've already gone through this many times. That's okay. I want you to understand what the Bible says. Have it concrete in, in your heart and your mind. All right, so first we're going to talk about the false ideals. We're going to correct some false ideas about the Lord's Supper. And the first thing I want you to see here is this. This is not the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus. So there, this is not a mass. 
We're not massacring the Lord Jesus here. Okay? Uh, this is not a mass. This is not the literal body. It's not the literal blood of Jesus. Now, even in this text, he made that clear. When he said, take this, is my body. This is my, uh, uh, this is my blood. And then he goes on, this cup, this bread, this cup, this bread. He clearly shows you he's not, it's not literal. But let's look at Luke 22 with me real quickly. Luke 22. Luke 22. Luke 22. And let's just think about something here. Luke 22. Just be, I want to be very brief on some of this stuff. Uh, Luke 22. Luke 22. Look at verse number 14. Luke 22, verse 14. Here's when Jesus Christ was initiating the Lord's Supper right here. Uh, and you can call it the Lord's Supper, you can call it the communion, that's biblical. To call this the communion, that's a biblical terminology. Amen. To call this the Lord's Supper, that's also biblical terminology, okay? The Bible calls them both. Now we come to Luke 22, look at verse number 14. And when the hours come, he sat down. Now notice this, when the hours come, he sat down. He's there with them. And the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with, with, with desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So before he's died, before he goes to the cross, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So this is going to take the place, so you know, of the Passover. Somebody asked ask the Passover meal. You know, some churches do this every week. Some churches do this once a quarter. Some churches do this once a month. There is no biblical mandate. The Bible's mandate is as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Now, we do it once a year. So why do we do it once a year? This took the place of the Passover meal. And taking the place of the Passover meal, how often did, it take, how often did they eat the Passover meal? They did it once a year. So we're using that same principle to follow along. Now, would it be wrong to do it once a week? It would not be wrong. Would it be wrong to do it once a quarter? It would not be wrong. The Bible doesn't give you some religious rules where you got to follow on this. He just says, as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. So let's go back to this passage, okay? Verse number 17. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this. Take what? Not me. He didn't say, take me. He said, take this. This what? It says, this cup. And divide it among yourselves. Invite it, not me. Don't divide me. Divide, divide it. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took what? He didn't take himself. He took the bread and gave thanks. And break, what does it say? He broke it, the bread, not himself. He didn't break himself right here. He's sitting there whole. He broke it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do was say remembrance of me likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you one of my friends talked to me before the services and uh, was wanting to uh, asking me about the the juice I wanted to be able to drink the juice and uh, and I was talking to my friend and uh, anyway and uh, went through and basically told my friend that they shouldn't, they can't take of the fruit tonight, the juice tonight. My, my friend, I told him that, because my friend was not saved yet. And uh, he didn't understand on, on it. And uh, he asked me, he says, is there blood, is there blood in all that juice? <laughs> I said, no, nobody. I'll tell you what that is. That's actually just like my, I took out my driver's license. I said, who is that? He said, that's you, that's pastor. I said, that's right, that's me, isn't it? I said, but you know what that is? That's only a picture of me, really, because I'm sitting here right beside you. I said, that's exactly what that grape juice is. That's just a picture of the blood. It's red because it's blood. blood's red. It's a picture of the blood. He said, what's that bread that we're going to eat of? What's that picture of? He said, that's a picture of the body. I said, the body of who? The body of Jesus I said, that's good. So I'm teaching this, my friend, doctrine. <laughs> and that's exactly what this is. Yeah. My friend knows more Bible just then, now, than people 30 and 40 years old that take the Mass every single day, every single week. <laughs> he knows more Bible. That's just taught my little friend a good Bible doctrine. That's all. This is only a picture. It's not the literal body, not the literal blood. You need to get a hold of that. If this is literally the blood of Jesus. We're all drinking blood. We're all like cannibals. 
and were eating his literal body. That's a cannibalism. That's heathenism. That is actually heathenism. That is paganism. That is actually heresy. And I think it's very interesting that Paul, in talking about the Lord's Supper, he said there must needs be heresies among you in connection with the Lord's Supper. That's what he's talking about. It is her 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 heresy to teach certain teachings about it. And one of them is that's a literal body and that's a literal blood. Okay, so that's not Jesus Christ's literal body. That's not Jesus Christ's literal blood. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 again. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to go back to that, so keep your finger there. Keep your marker there. The next thing I want you to see is that this, this Lord's Supper is not to give you eternal life. The Lord's Supper does not give you salvation. It does not add to your salvation. If you take the Lord's Supper, uh, uh, if you're not born again, you're not saved, you take the Lord's Supper, you will still die and go to hell without Jesus. Right. And, you know, it's very interesting. Some people who actually think this is the literal blood and think this is the literal body of Jesus, they take it and every single week, sometimes every day, some of them do every day, yeah. And yet you ask them, do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? No man can know. But you've just received Jesus, you said, every single day. How could you not know? The Bible says, to as many as received him, them gave you power to become the sons of God. Why aren't you, don't you know? Because it's false doctrine. This does not give you eternal life, okay? And so just like baptism doesn't give you eternal life, what baptism is this? This doesn't either. Look at 1 John, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 27. As a matter of fact, if you partake of this supper unworthily, you will take to yourself damnation. So if you take of this unworthily, you are eating and drinking damnation to yourself. That's what it said in the passage. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 and 29. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh uh, damnation himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, so if you eat and drink of this and you're unworthy, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. Now, how could that be? He says, let a man examine himself. Now, I think it's interesting. Paul the Apostle used it in another place. Let a man examine himself. He used that word examine, examine, examine. What did he say? Examine yourself. Whether ye be in the faith. Whether you're saved or not. Whether you're born again or not. So, if your man needs to examine himself, am I saved? And so you need to, before you take of this, ask yourself, am I truly saved? Am I born again? Do I know for sure I'm going to heaven? Am I in the faith? And if you are not in the faith, you are not saved. If you partake of this with not being in the faith, you are partaking unworthily. That's what it means. You are taken unworthy. You cannot be worthy unless you're saved. Because all of us are sinners. All of us, the very best man at his best is altogether vanity. And so I cannot be worthy to take this unless the Lord Jesus Christ takes his blood and washes me and makes me white as snow. And now I become worthy. I come boldly to the throne of grace, right? I can now, once I'm saved, go boldly to Christ. Boldly. I don't have to worry, be concerned. I come boldly. Now I'm worthy because I'm in Christ. Amen. See, before I was in Christ, I couldn't even pray to God. I wasn't worthy for Him to listen to me. But once I got saved, now I am in Christ. And now I come through Christ. It's Christ who is in me. In the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Does that make sense to you? That's how that so 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 some people get very scared also about this, about taking the Lord's Supper. And that's a good thing to come with a, a fearful heart and 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 to think about your sins, things of that nature. But I'm gonna tell you something. Don't let that fear keep you away from this wonderful time of, of getting to worship the Lord here. Amen. Okay, because if you're saved, if you're saved, born again, child of God, you are worthy in Christ. The one that's not worthy is the one that's not in the faith. 
That's the one that's not worthy, okay? And so, it's, so again, praise God for a King James Bible, Bible in English. We look at that word examine. Look where Paul used it in the same kind of book. And we see, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. And that makes things so much easier. We don't have to worry about what a man says. The Bible itself tells you what he's talking about. Let a man examine himself. So if you're here, and, and, and listen, I'm not going to examine you. Some people say, well, can I take of it? Can I not? It's not my place to tell you if you can, you can't. I'm not God. I don't believe I have the power. Now, some churches believe they do. I don't believe I do. The Bible is very clear. Let a man examine himself. It's not my job to examine you. I'm not going to examine you whether or not you're worthy or not. It's not my job. It's up to you to examine yourself. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say, yep, you're saved, you're saved, you're lost, you're lost, you're saved, you're saved, you're lost. You're... Now, by the way, I'm not going to do that. You know why? I couldn't tell if I wanted to tell. Because <laughs> I don't know what's in your heart. <laughs> I can't tell what's in your heart. How can I? The Bible says, you know, it's only thou and thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men. I cannot tell what's in somebody's heart. I can't tell whether somebody's saved or lost. I can't tell. You talk to me and tell me I'm trusting this. Well, I got to go by what you say. I don't know, really. But you're going to have to determine this. Are you saved? And if you're not saved, get saved today. And then you can take of it. That's, I, just get born again today. But before I get through, say, yes, I trust in what Jesus Christ did for me. Hey, he's died for me. He shed his blood for me. He was buried. Was good, and I want to be saved. Please save me, Lord. Amen. And put your trust on him. Now, you got to remember, being saved is, let's try to explain some things. Being saved is not a certain prayer. Yeah. It's not, did I ask those words when I prayed? No, that's not how you get saved. Yeah. Being saved is when your heart quits trusting in you and you put your trust in Jesus there's no certain kind of special magical prayer at that it's not a magical prayer I said these magical words and that makes me God's child no 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 it's did you give your heart to the Lord did you trust in the Lord that's how you get saved you know and so somebody says well did you say these words you say those words what words there's no words in the Bible. The, only, the closest thing you can get to a sinner's prayer is, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. That's the closest thing you can get to a sinner's prayer in the Bible. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. What he's saying is, God, I'm a sinner. I need mercy. Will you give it, God? And the Bible says, that man went down to his house justified. That's what he did. The Bible just says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man on the cross, Lord, remember me. That's all he cried out. Lord, remember me. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. It's no, he, I mean, if, if, if some Baptist would have examined him, What'd you say? <laughs> he said, well, I'm sorry. You need to do it again. <laughs> Though that man gave his heart to Jesus Christ and trusted in the Lord, that man's born again. That man's saved. That's how you get saved. Amen. It's not a special prayer, special words. It's about trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. All right. So if you've done that, you're worthy. You're worthy. Now, now if you're lost and you partake of that, all you're doing is reaping more damnation to yourself. That's it. Now, not, not only that, but also look at the passage again, 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 29. For he that eat and drinketh, unwor drinketh unworthily, eat and drinketh would say, damnation to himself, not discerning what? Lord. See, what they're thinking about is that's the body. Yeah. No, you're not discerning right. That's not the body. Right. You don't understand what it means to be saved. Yeah. If you think that's the literal body of Jesus, you're not discerning what the literal body of Jesus is. Yeah. And so you're not doing right. Now, so not only that, but also, again, Paul, the apostle in the same chapter, says this, says that for by one spirit, next chapter, actually, same book, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. He's not even talking about the bread at all. He is talking about the body of Christ. You don't understand what it means to be saved. You don't, you're, not, you're thinking that this is, makes you part of Christ. No, no, no. You've got to be baptized by the Spirit of God into the body. You must be saved. That's how you get saved. And if you're not saved, you're, you're not understanding that, you need to get saved tonight. Amen. And then you can 
be part of the body and you can partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, I'll tell you something else. The Bible says in verse number 28 again, But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And then verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. This time is a special time to remember the Lord, which we've already done showed you. It's to remember Him. God's given us a picture. It's to, this is not His literal body, literal blood. But it's also a time where we and I, we do need to judge ourselves. Number one, am I saved? Number two, am I walking right with God? Now, let me tell you something. If you're saved, you're worthy. But let me tell you something. This would be a good time for you to examine yourself. Am I walking with God? Have I got some sin in my life that I need to repent of? You need to pray and think, think about that before you take the Lord's Supper. Not only that, is my heart right with my brother or my sister? If you've got bitterness in your heart toward the body of Christ, you need to get your heart right before you take the Lord's Supper. Because now he's talking to Christians. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now he's talking to the people of God. And so if you're here and your heart's not right toward a brother and toward a sister, you need to get right with them and you get right with God. It's important. People all the time taking the Lord's Supper and, they, and they've got bitterness and anger in their heart and malice in their heart. And God's not happy with that. Because we are the body of Christ. And if I don't treat you right, I'm not treating Jesus right. If I'm not discerning, hey, you're a part of the body of Christ. It's like I'm a part of the body of Christ. And, we don't, and I don't treat you right. Listen, God's not happy with me. And He's going to judge me. And so we need to take a time, during this time, and judge ourselves. You don't need to have a bad spirit toward one another. Let a man examine himself. And another thing, too, this is not to get full on. That's what he's addressing in this chapter. What they were doing, they were doing like, sort of like some churches. And they weren't even using the right bread, probably, and things of that nature. Because he has to teach them about the unleavened bread. And they probably had a, had a loaf of bread here and, and had, the, had all this stuff. And they're, and, he's, and they're just getting full on it. They're coming here and having a party over this thing. And he says, hey, listen to you guys. This is not to come and eat the Lord's Supper. He said, well, what are we about to do then? You're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. You're going to, what you're going to do, you're going to remember the Lord. This is not to get full on. This is not your supper. This is not your tea, okay? This is not your dinner. This is to remember the Lord. Amen. That's what it is. Okay, so you don't do that. Now, next thing. What do we use? Well, we use unleavened bread. Amen. Now, do you know why we use unleavened bread? I've got to be very quickly here. You know I use unleavened bread? Because leaven in the Bible, let's just look at it real quickly. Look at Matthew, uh, Matthew 16 with me. Now, leaven in the Bible is not always a symbol of this, but many times a symbol of this. Look at Matthew 16. Look at Matthew 16. Look at Matthew 16. Look at verse number 6. Let me show you something. Matthew 16, verse 6. Some of you come from other churches, and they use a loaf of bread. That's heresy. That's against the Bible. To use an actual loaf of bread is against the Bible. Okay, some people use alcoholic wine. That is a heresy. Both of those, if it's leavened bread, if it's, if it's like a loaf of bread, that means it has leaven in it. Leaven is like yeast. That's what makes it rise. So when you go buy a loaf of bread at the shop at Woolies to make you a sandwich, that is called leavened bread. That's what that is, okay? That's bread that's got yeast in it. Okay, if you buy alcoholic wine, the Bible is two different kinds of wines. There's alcoholic wine, and there's unfermented wine. Now, alcoholic wine, it has yeast. It has some kind of something in it to make it grow, to bubble. That's what it does. Okay, all right, now look at Matthew chapter 16. And the Bible calls that yeast leaven. Look at Matthew 16. Different kinds of leaven, but yeast is one of those. Look at Matthew 16, look at verse number 6. Then Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of what? 
the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we take taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he saith unto them, said unto them, sorry, O ye little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves, the five thousand, how many baskets took ye up, took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, how many baskets took ye up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the what? Doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So leaven is a picture here of false doctrine. In the Bible, leaven many times is a picture of sin. It's a picture of sin. Now, if the bread represents the body of Christ, did Jesus Christ's body have any sin in it? No, he was the spotless lamb of God without sin. And so therefore he tells us, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look what he says here, 1 Corinthians 5. Look, he says over here in verse number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 7, 7 and 8. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are, as ye are what? Amen. He's talking about the body of Christ. For even Christ our Passover sacrifice for us. Therefore let us keep the what? Amen. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread. unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So what kind of bread does God want us to use? Unleavened, unleavened bread. Now remember this took the place of the Passover meal. The Passover was a literal lamb. And then they had a Passover meal to remember that lamb. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ became our Passover. He's our lamb. We have a meal to remember the lamb of God that died for us. Now, the, unle the bread in the Passover was always unleavened bread. Always. Because it's a picture of the spotless lamb of God. I hope that's making sense to you. Now, look at Matthew 26. Look at Matthew 26. Amen. So the bread we use, not a loaf of bread, we use unleavened bread. And it is highly important because this represents the body of Christ. Now, since it represents the body of Christ, you say, what's the big deal about representation not being, not being followed? Well, think about Moses. God said, I want you to speak to that rock. He took his rod out and he hit that rock. Because he hit that rock, God was angry with him. You know what happened? He says, Moses, because you did wrong, you hit that rock twice. You can't go to the promised land. Why? He just hit a rock. Well, I mean, what's wrong with hitting a rock? Because that rock represented Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm the rock, and I only get smoked once. I only get massacred one time. Don't you massacre me every single week, every single day, or two times. I'm only going to die one time. Amen. Amen. So a symbol is very important to God. It's very important. So that bread must be, it must be unleavened bread. And if you ever partake of something that's called the Lord's Supper and it's not unleavened bread, that's not the Lord's Supper. And God's not happy with it. Now, what about the cup? Look at Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 26. Matthew 26, verse number 26. The Bible says this. I think this is the one I want to look at. I hope I didn't put it down the wrong passage. Let's see. Matthew 26, verse number 26 to 29. That's it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. All of it. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the mission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this what? Fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it what? New with you in my Father's kingdom. All right, so we learn one thing right here from the Bible. This cup, what's inside that cup? It's fruit. fruit. Fruit of the vine. Now go to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. And he says when he drinks, he's going to drink it new. Look at Genesis chapter 40 with me. Genesis chapter 40. I'm teaching a lot of Bible here. Genesis chapter 40. And I'll look at one more passage while you look there. Genesis chapter 40. This is Bible teaching. Genesis chapter 40. All right. 
Yes, sir, 40, let's look at verse number 6. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and looked up upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of, of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore took ye, look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph. And he said to him, In my dream, behold, a what? A vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches. And it was as though it were budded. And her blossoms shot forth. And the what? Clusters there brought forth what? What kind of grapes? So we learned the fruit of the vine is talking about grapes. Now let's keep going. And Pharaoh, verse 11, And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the what? Grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Well, what was that? Was that alcoholic wine? No, it was fresh, squeezed grape juice, what the Bible often calls new wine. Look at Isaiah 65 with me. Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Isaiah 65, verse 8. I'm teaching you something. It's going to help you, by the way. More than just the Lord's Supper here. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Thus said the Lord as the what? Where is it found? In the cluster. And one said, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servant's sake, that I, that I may not destroy them all. So what's inside of that cluster? You go to a vine, and there's a cluster of grapes. What's inside of that grapes? Wine. Bible calls that wine. It calls it new wine. And if we were to squeeze that out, that's going to be fresh squeezed grape juice, which the Bible would call wine. <laughs> but it calls it. You say, why does God do that? Make it so hard on us. Because you know why? He says, you want to find something to hang yourself on, I'll give it to you. You don't want, you don't want to follow me. You want to look for a reason to drink. I'll give you a lot of verses. I'll give you a lot of... You say, would God do that? Yes, He would. You say, He gives verses to make people think that they got to be baptized in water to go to heaven. Yeah. You say, does God do that? He does, because He's reading your heart. Right. If your heart doesn't want to know God, God says, you want to believe, you want to trust your works, I'll give you a, I'll give you a Bible verse that say you can trust your works. Yeah. Acts 2, verse number 38. He that believeth is baptized. Uh, sorry, if you believe and you get baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There you go. You got to be baptized in water. See, God wants to test your heart. He writes things in such a way that you can't figure it out unless you read the whole Bible. Amen. And if you're looking for a reason to not to believe the truth, he'll, He will give it to you in the Bible. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry that believes the false doctrine has got a Bible verse for it. They're just twisting it, not taking the whole Bible together. Matter of fact, if I was a Catholic, I'd just take you to that verse over there. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. You see that? Eat my flesh. That's what it says. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Yes, what it says. <laughs> then I'd take you over there. If I want to teach, teach purgatory, I'd teach you over there about the one that uh, uh, owed his Lord so much money. But then what happened was he didn't forgive his service. So God threw him inside a thing until he paid everything. See there? You're going to suffer until you pay it all in purgatory. I just give you some Bible verses to teach a Catholic doctrine. But it's twisting the word of God to their own destruction. You better take the Bible all together. Look at Proverbs number 27. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. So I can give you a verse. Well, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy belly's sake. Yeah. There you go, man. You better be drinking some wine <laughs> for your belly's sake. I'll even give you some drunken scientists to try to agree with you. <laughs> And you can find some drunken, you can find some drunkards to write little articles on the, on the little Google thing for you. God will even give it to you, God says. I'll let it happen. You say God that way, yes He is. Yes He is, because He's judging your heart. He's judging your heart. You want to be a drunkard? He'll let you be a drunkard. Matter of fact, God even says in the Bible, says, go get drunk. God says that. Go get drunk. That's what God says. Well, there's your Bible verse to go party it up, guys. <laughs> Take it out of context. Twisting it. 
Are you guys getting what I'm trying to help you with? It's important you believe that whole book. But it says over here in the book of Proverbs 27, I think it is, Proverbs, is it Proverbs 27 or Proverbs 25? Brother Fred, help me out. Where he talks about don't drink it when it starts to move. Proverbs 20, 23. Proverbs 23, that's what it says, verse 23. Proverbs 23 is where it's at. Verse number 31, verse 23, 31. Got to go real quickly. Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup. What's it say? What's that mean when it starts bubbling? When it starts fermenting. But it says, verse number 32, At the last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. He wants to get drunk all the time. And that's the way it is, because it makes him feel good. And God says what you shouldn't do. So when you see that wine start to move, don't even look at it. Why? Because it's like it's, it's memorizing. It'll take you. He didn't have him taste the old wine. doesn't want the new anymore. Because it grabs you like a snake in the bottles. It grabs you. And it can't, you can't get loose. Young people don't even take one drink. Because one drink allows to hook you. And even if you get off of it, you will go years and there'll be some kind of little serpent use that one drink. Remember that taste? Bang. Yeah. And draw you back in. Some men, people here, some men and women who struggle with that thing, they got right with God. Even before they got saved, they messed with that thing. Then they got saved. Listen, you still live with that old man. And those are the people that are saved and, have, and got victory over that. You know you still, you got to be careful. You've got to be careful. And so, because you messed up. Now, young people, listen to me. You don't want to have to battle that battle. Amen. And so the Bible says, woe to him to give a drink to his neighbor. Just one drink will mess you up. Yeah. You say, just one drink, just one drink. Just one drink can mess you up. And next thing you know, it's got you. And you can get over that. You can, I've known people that have been done with that for years, 10, 15, 20 years. And just met one drink on a, on a New Year's Eve or a birthday party. And next thing you know, all those 15 years thrown down the drain. And they got to start all over. Yeah. It's a terrible thing, brothers and sisters. That's why, how dare a church tempt people? Yeah. How dare a church create wickedness like that? How dare a preacher preach that rubbish? Amen. He, the Bible says, it better for him that, a, that he was millstone hanged about his neck and cast into the sea yeah. yep. than to offend one of these little ones. Yeah. That's what he's doing. Yeah. And damnable heresy. Yeah. Damnable heresy. And it's a serious thing. Yeah. It's a serious thing. So this is not alcoholic wine. It's new wine. Look at Deuteronomy 32. One more passage on this subject. I want you to see this. Brothers and sisters, it's so serious. I can't tell you how serious this is. You know, there'll be some little, some little choir boys inside of a, a church that comes from Babylon. And they're going to go in there when the priest is not looking. Going to get in there and mess with that stuff. It happens all the time. Getting drunk inside a quote-unquote church. Well, that's a shame. Yeah, that's a shame. Look at Deuteronomy 32. The Bible says this. This is what the Bible has to say about that. 31, 32, 31. For their rock, notice it says lowercase rock. They got like something like, they say it's Peter, but it's not Peter. For their rock is not as our rock. Ours is, a, ours is the big rock. Ours is the true rock. That's Jesus. Even our enemies themselves being judges, they know that. <laughs> For their vine is of the vine of what? And the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are what? Bitter. Bitter. That's alcoholic. Matter of fact, you Australians know that. They call it bitters. You know that. That's what it's called. VB. That's a different bitter. That's the ungodly's bitter. That leads to sodomy. Unfortunately, it does. Again, young children, listen to me. You be careful drinking with your mates. You be careful. Some of you, especially you Christian boys and girls, 
You start drinking, you might find yourself messed up with sodomy before you know it. Amen. You don't mess with that bitter stuff, it'll mess you up. Verse number 33, their wine is the, is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. So we don't drink fermented wine. That's highly, highly important. So what is the Lord's Supper? Real quickly, we're out of time. Number one, it's a remembering. When you take of this and you don't take of the bread, you start taking that and you start chomping on that. Remember, it was, the, it was Jesus Christ's body that was broken for you. And guess, who's, guess who he was broken for, for you. Guess, who, guess who's, why he had to die on the cross? Because of your sin. See, each in, in, notice that each individual takes it. We don't, we don't we, I can't take it for you. Just like that, you individually must receive Christ. You must individually understand that he died for you as an individual. Some of us say, well, of course he died for the whole world. That's good that you know that. But to be saved, you had to know he died for you individually. If you'd have been the only one in the whole world, Jesus Christ still would have come and died for you because he loved you. And because you are a sinner worthy to go to hell. And so when you partake of that, it's remember his body. And it was you that caused his body to be brut brutally beaten, on that, beaten and hung on that cross. You caused that. Your sin caused that. And it reminds you of that. And you just think, thank you, God, Lord. That body is where I get my nourishment from. It's because of what you did, I get life. You remember when you take of that cup, which is grape juice, which is a picture of the blood. You drink that cup. That blood was poured out for you. And again, notice, it's individually. You've got to take it. You individually must receive it. You remember. Number two, you reflect. Reflect. Number one, am I saved? Before you take of, the, take of the Lord's Supper, am I saved? If you're not saved, get saved today. And I'm trying to make it as clear as I can. Salvation is not found in a church. It's not found in a baptism. It's not found in the Lord's Supper. Salvation is found in you receiving the blood of Christ as your payment for your sins. You trusting in what he did, his body being broken for you. That's what it's about, and you receive it individually. Now, number one, am I saved? Number two, am I sanctified? Am I living right? Is my heart right toward my brother? Is my heart right toward my spouse? Is my heart right toward my children? Is my heart right toward my parents' children? Is my heart right toward my pastor? You should think about that before you take the Lord's Supper. And if it's not, say, God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. I want to get my heart right. Lord, please. And God, Lord, please forgive me for this sin. I laid on the cross of Calvary. Number one, am I saved? Number two, am I sanctified? Number three, reflect, ask yourself, am I sincere about this thing? Am I, is this just a big joke to me? Is religion and Christianity and church just a big something I do? Or is it, I'm a Christian and I really want to follow the Lord. It's a time of remembering, a time of reflecting, and it's a time of repenting. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 3. Last passage for tonight. Revelation chapter 3. Here verse number 14. And under the angel of the church, the latest things right, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of the mouth. Because thou sayest, I am in reach, increase of goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, trying to burn in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salves, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and what does it say? Sup with him. So we get the word supper from. And sup with him and he with me. You know what this is a time of? Repenting, saying, God, I'm sorry. And God, I just want to get right with you. I want my relationship stored with you. And God says, if you do that, I'm going to come in. I'm going to sup with you. We're going to have a supper together. And it's going to be sweet fellowship together. Remember when Jesus Christ rose, uh, died and rose in the grave? He was walking on the road to, with, 
Demaeus. And he has two guys talking to them, and their hearts are burning within them. And they still don't know it's Jesus until they sit down. And he takes the bread, and he breaks it. When he breaks that bread, their eyes are opened, and they knew it was Jesus. There's something special about the breaking of the bread. There's something special about the Lord's Supper. I, I don't understand it fully, but there's just something special about it. And when our hearts get right with God, and when we get, and we get repent of our sin, and we do right, and it's talking about the church of God repenting there, then he comes and he subs with us a special way as we remember what he did for us. It's very, very special. And so this is a special time, a special time of worship. It's not a religious time. It's a time of worship. And I pray that you'll be worshipped. So let's, let's just have a little short time of, of talking to the Lord before we take the Lord's Supper. And so this would be a time for you to talk to God, come to the altars, bow where you're at, do anything that you want to do. And we're going to take the Lord's Supper here shortly, okay? So let's just take a time to pray. If it was you, if I was you, and this is what I'm going to do rather, I'm going to pray and ask God, number one, to search me. If there's anything wicked in my heart, that God just take that away. God, if I need to get right with somebody, God, show me. And, uh, and I'm just going to, then I'm going to just thank him for dying for me. That's what I'm going to do. And being buried in the grave. I'm going to thank him for the blood and the body. Why don't you do that? If you're not here, you're not saved, get saved today. You don't have to come to the altar to get saved. Get saved where you're at. Trust on Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's pray. You pray in your own time, and then shortly I'll get these men to come forward. You men, when you get through praying, you two men that I've talked to, after you get through praying, you'll come forward for me. It'll be a blessing.